So let me start by thanking Dr. Reddy. We are so fortunate to have someone with his vision joining us in this important series of Fiki Fast Forward, where we look at the future. And in this case, we're looking at the future of healthcare. Uh, we will have the opportunity to hear from one of the brightest minds, the greatest visionaries, uh, an entrepreneur, also a doctor, a cardiologist, and from my perspective, also a fabulous father of four extremely talented women, one of whom is our president of FIKI right now, Sangeeta Reddy, who is steering FIKI to greater heights. Dr. Reddy, as you look at the future going forward, how are you seeing the healthcare sector in India and what are the key areas that you see as ones that we need to address as Indians in terms of health and healthcare? Thank you, Nana. It's, it's wonderful uh, speaking with you. Uh, we have interacted before, and I think I admire the various ways you have helped many, many of the industries and the businesses and the revenue to go up and the GDP of the country made a significant impact, it's wonderful. I think it's very uh, well what you said. Today, we are all afraid of what is called, not afraid, the whole world is in panic because of a new disease called coronavirus, which spread from China uh, and uh, now, turned, uh, now it's become a COVID-19 uh, uh, going on into the 20s. It is, it is a virus which is affecting, uh, which is transmitting so rapidly. Uh, although the China could contain it within one province, today the entire world, almost all countries are involved uh, in a very, very long uh, back. And I must admire India for the various steps they have taken early enough. You know, they, they brought back our people from various countries immediately, and then did what's called the uh, lockdowns, which helped the transmission of the disease to a very large extent. And uh, most importantly, to treat these patients, you need a lot of it, uh, in, intensive care equipment, the, uh, the so-called protective equipment for the doctors and uh, nurses and the paramedics. I think I, I want to give my admiration and adoration for the, the entire healthcare teams that have worked, you know, when people are so scared back at home, here are the people facing the corona patients, but they need the protection for themselves. So okay. we did not have that amount of PPEs uh, and uh, ventilators to treat the sick patients. So I think Government of India did a great job uh, uh, as rapidly as possible to import this, to import the, the kits, medical kits that are necessary to test people. And uh, Prime Minister himself went at least three, four times to warn people saying that this disease, is, uh, this COVID is highly infectious and there are three major steps that everybody should take, you know, the stay, uh, safe distance, uh, the, you know, the, the washing the hands and, and the mouth, uh, yeah. mask for mask to face so that you don't contaminate others or won't get the infection. I think so all these steps are necessary. Are we, Dr. Reddy, are we uh, uh, invested enough in terms of healthcare facilities or did COVID bring very starkly to light the fact that maybe we haven't got enough hospitals, enough equipment, enough doctors, enough of anything, uh, not just for a pandemic, but for all the annual diseases we often see, whether it's malaria or tuberculosis or any of the uh, illnesses which uh, we see in large numbers in the country. Uh, so uh, do we need to invest more? And if so, how would you suggest we, we look at that? I, I, I think I've always been t talking about this thing. We, do, we need to do this. Uh, starting from people, I always say we need to double our uh, doctors, triple our nurses, quadruple our paramedics to meet the, uh, the, the health staff in the country. It's not only the country. We have got the largest number of young people if you train more doctors, more nurses, more nurses, more pharmacists. Today, 
the world needs several hundreds and millions of them. So I think this could be a very, very great thing, supplying these people to the world so that they will be thankful to you and then their remittances will come to India. So you're not only getting the job, this is one industry which will continuously keep giving more and more jobs to fulfill the needs of our, of our nation and the needs, healthcare needs of the world. Uh, and even hospitals, we don't have sufficient number of hospitals. Uh, we need to increase at least 100,000 beds. What needs to be done to do this? We have enough people, we have uh, enough uh, colleges. Why are we running short of talent and not being able to export more? Why do we not have more hospitals? What does government need to do to create the eco environment? These are the two things. First thing, I think, uh, sort of the people training uh, concern. I think we had a very uh, conservative uh, um, organization, not letting permission for more and more training centers to be established, whether it's for doctors, for nurses, or for technology. Now I think they've doubled, ramped this up, and still what they're doing for nurses is not enough. If they can train, if a college can train 250 doctors, they should be able to train 250 or more nurses. Yes. And similarly, if the paramedics, there is not enough attention. The med skills have come in, but I think we, they need a little flip to, to train and the programs should happen. And uh, we depended completely on so-called classrooms as of uh, what was existed 100 years ago. I think today, our technology can permit uh, using technology. Uh, yeah. the, now the children, my great-grandsons, are learning uh, the, every day. They're going through three hours of classes every yeah. morning. So if they can do it, and I think we could train more yeah. doctors, more nurses, more paramedics to meet our needs and meet the rest of the world. Yeah. That's why they uh, I put a very good question. Do we have sufficient uh, you know, hospitals and healthcare needs for the country? The answer is no, because the funding available for, from, for, from government was 1%. We requested that it be 3%. And the private is investing 5%, either through insurance or by cash. This, I think, I wish this all translated to insurance, and then that becomes 10%, 7%. If 7% individual invests into insurance, health insurance, and government puts in 3%, 10% is reasonable because we are lowest even compared to the neighboring countries. The mm. state has spent, you know, something like 7.8 to 9%. And we are uh, we we need to step up that funding. They have now increased to one to one point five percent, but the amount they're spending for this COVID is yeah. happily utilized also for uh, training more and more centers and giving permission for people to to do. I'll give you one small example. Of what it can? We have about six hundred and twenty-five district hospitals in the country, which are poorly managed, which are poorly handled. Uh, they gave us a permission for a medical college in my district headquarters, Chitor. So I thought that I should leave something back for the district in training people. So I, I, I requested for the district hospital to be the medical college uh, hospital. Originally, it was a 300 bed hospital. Probably about 35, 40 percent, 40 patients were there. Um, but when we took over, and 100 to 150 outpatients. Today, that hospital is now 750 beds. Oh, wow. Completely online. And the average attendance is around 2,000 per day. Yeah. Completely so nearly 200 COVID patients in a district hospital. Yeah. So I think this is where we have all these 650. If they can invest, or if they can co invest with a private individual, yeah. uh, it, it could make a significant impact in elevating the healthcare for our people. And also the constant complaint that we all have is people in the metro have too much health, but there are not enough help for people who are living in uh, yeah. the small towns and in the villages. So yeah. this district and the Taluk Hospital would make a very significant impact. I think this is the lesson that we need to learn uh, from uh, the COVID experience, the yeah. shortages that they felt, but I must admire the public health care system the doctors, the nurses, they, they gave their life, uh, yeah. you know, in this.
and the private cooperated. As far as Apollo is concerned, we also participated as one of the major private healthcare players. We, uh, in, uh, we launched what's called the Apollo 24 to 7. Yes, it's and a great which is Great. available for anyone, number one, their forehead is scanned. So they could put put that that will put the questions. If you answer those questions, automatically it gives an idea whether you are free from COVID or you're yeah. suspected for, for COVID or proven for COVID. Yeah. To treat these patients, we started a new scheme called the Kavach, Apollo Kavach. Apollo Kavach is not everybody that has corona need to go into a hospital and go into an ICU bed. So it yeah. had stay one, stay two. There are, all the hotels were not functioning. We took a number of hotels across the country and yeah. then started putting them there. And then when they develop some symptoms, yeah. you know, one out of five, one out of 10, might develop some symptoms, we brought them to hospital. In hospital, again, we had separate uh, uh, patients with minimal symptoms and patients who need to go into intensive care unit. But isn't this a fabulous model going forward, not just for COVID, but to have the, the local society, uh, residential complex based uh, clinics uh, to grow these, maybe even specialty clinics across the cities, uh, maybe even in rural India, that uh, does not require us to go into these big hospitals all the time. Uh, uh, it's a fabulous model. And I understand that this is something you are, have really started in India. So it, the future looks really good for that. Uh, which are really, the cities? You are really pushing us to talk about what future of health will be in the world. Yeah. And the future of the world is not going to be in the hospitals all the time. Yes, yeah. hospitals are needed to treat emergencies, to treat heart attack, to, to treat, um, do major surgeries. But I think everything else should move to the home and to the clinics. Yeah. This is the future of healthcare. So we are ourselves moving on to see how we not increasing more hospital beds, but to see increase more healthcare facilities using the technology. Mm -hmm. Fortunately for us, the healthcare has got three major advantages this decade. Number one, artificial intelligence. We have taken an artificial intelligence company after global what they are doing is from home, first thing that you feel that you have some sort of illness. Immediately you can dial 24 into seven and that 24 into seven automatically will classify what you probably have, where you probably should go. And once if you say you are coming to a hospital, everything will be connected. If you need an ambulance, an ambulance will be at your door. And when the moment you come, you will be received. The treatment will, be, will become very smooth. This yeah. is the entire path is being done. Then I think that the more and more automation is happening. We bought in robotics early, early enough, but still what we have is very little as the need of the country. So I think robotics will completely change the way we are doing surgeries, even heart surgeries. We are doing, uh, we have done the world's largest yeah. heart surgeries, 185 or 190,000 surgeries as of today. Not only numbers, even in our success rates are higher, and uh, the government will be happy to know. We don't charge $50,000 because that is why I started. I lost a patient who couldn't raise $50,000. Today, we charge for an ordinary patient three to $4,000. But uh, his success rates, again, is the same as the best centers in the world. The best center today is uh, Cleveland Clinic. We compare our results with Cleveland Clinic, all yeah. of our And in everything else, I think, the Indian healthcare has come a long way. The yeah. private healthcare has made a significant impact in improving, the, in managing almost everything. In transplant, mm -hmm. for example, whether it's a heart transplant or liver transplant or lung transplant, in this COVID time, yeah. we, we did two lung transplants. One Jordan and came from an air ambulance and one from Ahmedabad came here. Both had two lung transplants and two successive days. We had a few liver transplants and a few kidney transplants. Yeah. But I think this, the, the way we, we deal with uh, illness has significantly improved because of the, the technologies that are available, the technologies yeah. we have to adopt. I think we need to increase it more and more. But yeah. what you said is right. Are you going to increase your hospitals? The answer is no. 
Uh, what we need is we increase, we need to increase more and more healthcare facilities so that even why should a patient have chemotherapy in a hospital? Why should he have dialysis in a hospital? He should be yeah. close to his home. If not in his house, at least it should be close to his home. So yeah. where he and his family will be very comfortable. So I think it, the whole uh, delivery sector of healthcare delivery need to change and it will change. And what is helping us is the artificial intelligence, the automation, the robotics are making a significant impact in helping us in yeah. very smoothly transforming uh, the healthcare system uh, in our country. Um, great so, thing we are here for patients. We are so let, me, let me ask you, say, as a, a run-of-the-mill patient, uh, in your uh, vision of healthcare delivery going forward, these, uh, let's, whether it's a neighborhood clinic or a clinic that, uh, that is smaller than uh, ideally near home, uh, how big would this clinic be? Does it provide overnight facilities? Uh, will it be specialty based? How would you envisage this going forward? And I think specifically for respiratory issues, given that COVID has very dire respiratory uh, uh, consequences, and of course, in India, because of pollution, we have a, a very large share of respiratory disease. Uh, how could someone who is a patient at, of uh, you know, asthma or respiratory disorders use one of these new order clinics uh, or uh, smaller hospitals that you're describing? Yeah, typically, today, we have what's called the clinics. Clinics don't have any inpatient beds. They yeah. do manual procedures. I think the number of procedures in each of these clinics were going to increase so that they don't have to go for small procedures, they don't have to go into a big, big hospital, walk into a big hospital. But uh, what you are saying about if they have respiratory problems, can COVID patients get treatment there? No, I think that was very clearly classified as stay one, stay two, yeah. like in a hotel or in, in, in a uh, safe place where the monitoring is going on through the nurse and the doctor. And yeah. the telemedicine is making a significant impact. This patient can directly talk to the nurse or can talk to one of our doctors. So yeah. uh, an average day, we are doing about a couple of thousand uh, teleconsults uh, from our, our, all of our consultants are participating in this. And these are people at home who are connecting with nurses or people in the ICU? Uh, these are people who are now at home or who are staying in the stay one or stay two. Okay. Uh, center. So minimal human outside contact. The hospital, outside the hospital. For them, it's a great advantage. They have got the comfort that there is a nurse around them yeah. uh, and all other equipment that is necessary for them uh, to, to, to be safe. Uh, plus, the advantage of uh, having a, a doctor consultation. On uh, call. Uh, at, uh, at, at a call. Yeah. Uh, pulmonologist, they get a cardiologist, they get a individual yeah. who have been there was need they need at that time. So I think this has made a significant uh, difference, and the pattern that is now evolved itself, I think, will will last as we move on to what we call the future yeah. of. Health. So I think uh, the, you know the way uh, you are describing this. Uh, my guess is you were already there in this thinking. But the COVID environment has only prompted you to uh, maybe push this out quicker. Uh, certainly, it would sound like people would be a lot happier dealing with this new structure, not having to go into a big hospital that is COVID designated. If you don't have a COVID disease, you just have a, a simple procedure or simple uh, uh, appointment which can sort you out. So uh, uh, it would be great to see other hospitals do the same. But is this what you see happening uh, across other hospitals? I think it's happening very early. Yeah, they were all caught up very quickly. They have. I'm happy that there's a, it's a large center. It's not just Apollo. But I think the system itself has caught up. Yeah. The less than 40% uh, of the patients are uh, in the 50% of our patients are in the hospital. Outside, yeah. even the governments have opened up large halls, putting up thousand patients. Yeah, I think it's very, very helpful thing, and uh, it eases the pressure on the hospital beds because yeah. we have 
uh, enough beds. As it is, we were short of beds, and I think uh, we will need. But my one advice for all of them is now, instead of panicking on COVID, whether they will get COVID and what happens if they get COVID, yeah. is make their health, health, you know, um, immunity, immunity by getting the NCDs tested and monitoring them well. If their NCDs are under control, diabetes is under control, hypertension is under control, and then the, the, you know their uh, lung functions uh, are under control, they yeah. won't have this severity. And also, what we are missing today is by people panicking, they are not coming to a hospital afraid that they they, they will get COVID. They are missing out that all the hospitals, not just about all the hospitals, have drawn an iron curtain between. COVID patients and non-patients. So the entry and exit for patients, COVID patients is one. Yeah. Similarly, the, uh, the doctors, the nurses, the paramedical staff, entire staff who treat COVID patients, they come yeah. to the entrance of war, they don't live together. They yeah. provide a separate accommodation for them so that they don't infect the normal people who are working on this side. But patients don't know this, so they're still ignoring and probably coming a little too late. For and other treatments. I'm so much scared of the cancers. Yeah. You know, cancers, uh, previously cancer was a death sentence. Um, four years ago when we had this international conference, they defined yeah. saying cancer is conquerable. Now, two years ago when we opened the proton, you know, we have a proton, which is probably the world's number one proton center, now, not available in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. but we opened it one and a half years ago, but our Honorable Vice President opened it. We had over 200,500 oncologists from around the world with 200 faculty from the Japan and the US and UK came. They all saw it, Dr. Reddy. This is something which the state of the art yeah. program center that you have to Very futuristic, yeah. First, for 100 patients, 42 were from US. And then interesting, there is a patient who went to Mayo, stayed there for six days, he paid $180,000 for Proton, but he yeah. was going through the phone this weekend. And suddenly he came across Apollo, Apollo Proton Center. And there was this, our doctor's names there. He talked to one doctor, second doctor, third doctor. And next day, Sunday, he called back and he said, suppose I come there, when will up my appointment be? Yeah. He said, if you come in three days, we'll be able to accommodate you. Yeah. He came and he had his appointment uh, done. And believe me, after he finished, he insisted on seeing me more than he, his wife has insisted. He came to my office and then said, Dr. Reddy, we are very proud of you. Because what you have brought to the world, I, I had cancer. The lady said I had cancer breast. I went to Royal Master and I saw your center treating can, uh, breast patients. Yeah. Phenomenal. My husband had this huge uh, uh, tumor. Yeah. A proton in 21 days, he's absolutely feeling normal. Yeah. The center there is not only great in technology, but the people, that is what Indians are capable of, being able to give care and compassion. Yeah. With them. So much better, and you are charging not $180,000, you are not even charging us $80,000. This is but such a great example. Such a great example, because, you know, Indian doctors are revered around the world. Uh, we, of course, have uh, so many excellent doctors here. Uh, nurses go out to the Middle East and are in high demand abroad. Uh, what often we missed, I think, was just the technologies and the investment in the institutional framework. And if that is now happening where we have world-class equipment, as you have described, uh, I think that is what we have lacked historically and we need more of. And it will attract better doctors and, of course, global patients. So a huge uh, amount of money for the country to earn in terms of uh, medical tourism as well. So it's a great example, uh, Dr. Reddy. I wish we could have more such uh, institutions of excellence in the country, which attract talent and attract patients. And uh, maybe that time has come when we will begin to see it. I'm sure it will get financed. As a banker, uh, it's, it would be very exciting to see these world-class institutions build up. As we go forward, uh, Dr. Reddy, oh, I mean, can I just say one word on what you said? Yeah. You said medical tourism. You said it yeah. very rightly. My 
thing is indian doctors indian the nurses are second to none yeah they i agree around the world they have proven this and if you have enough technology to back this them up they can give the same or better care than the best centers anywhere in the world yeah. and cost of fifth or even a fourth of the cost uh, that that's charged anywhere in the world yeah. in one fifth of the cost even as compared to singapore in yeah. that's but singapore has this proton yeah you know, for cancer treatment we have the total facility but having all of these if we do i think india can become the global healthcare destination and it's a 380 billion dollar industry growing and i think it made a very significant impact it is it was just picking up and uh, i'm sure in the matter of next few years if you play it right with the government you know like south korea south korea was no nowhere near uh, getting international patients but yeah all the embassies what their uh, ambassadors in spreading korea as a healthcare destination, destination. Mm-hmm. started with uh, now uh, in uh, singapore started then malaysia started germany has started but i think yeah. we have the potential which can last for a long long time because yeah. they don't have they are going to fall short of their technology but they will not have enough doctors enough nurses enough supporting staff i think yeah. this is the advantage india has to become the global healthcare destination yeah move this time for a long time and not only earn sufficient for next thing but to be enable to export uh, our doctors nurses and more yeah. importantly give build give lot of employment you know we can build more medical colleges more nursing colleges more technology colleges. all of these people will be used by us if there is great tourism we will also build more hospitals you know but for that sake but i think it's a huge opportunity india has in future health this should be top of the line of the government saying how yeah. can india develop itself as a global healthcare center yeah and i i think it will go beyond just institutions such as yourselves we have to be able to help people come through uh, immigration we need uh, you know specialized aircraft maybe uh we need to look at the end to end uh product because uh, you don't want to find the person's half dead just negotiating our roads and uh coming to the hospital for treatment and uh, post operative care as well so uh, uh uh i think uh, before uh we end here it would be uh, a real miss if we didn't discuss the whole telemedicine space uh dr reddy i know that uh, you know you have done so much in the csr well but mainstreaming delivery of medicine and uh, through telemedicine into rural and uh, lesser developed areas of the country uh, how do you see that playing out and uh, us being able to deliver proper health care uh, into the remote parts of the country i must tell you i saw this happening uh, from uh, when i was in boston and harvard the, from airport a patient was examined in uh, uh, mass general hospital so what i did is when i came back in 2002 uh, i connected my village the first satellite pension in the world apart from nasa yeah. satellite telehealth medicine in the world was from my village to hyderabad hospital and to the sent uh, uh, when bill clinton uh, president of the united states is yeah. not visit as president when he came to india he came to visit. hyderabad yeah, so i remember that we had this uh, at the, at the center he first his daughter visited so he was a little late he wanted to skip it he said no dad you must see it you love it so he came there and saw an young girl being examined in my village and they transmitted to a cardiologist at apollo hyderabad and the doctor told the mother your daughter has got a hole in the heart you can vacation and send it to us we'll fix when the when the school do open she'll join the school then he had another word she will lead a normal life you know he has ran out of bill uh, yeah. with his happiness and he said doctor ready this is a very wonderful thing that you have done the rest of the world should follow your lead so that people in remote places can get the benefit of high tech medicine yeah. so we have been doing a lot since that time 
because the technology was not freely available for us. Even when our uh, late president Karam, uh, uh, Abdul Kalam uh, uh, promised yep. the African countries telemedicine, mm -hmm. they did they gave them the sets, asked of uh, Ames Apollo and uh, Chitra Chirna. These three institutes should give the back advice. So we are still giving them, but not to that extent. But we have in several other countries installed, nearly about 40, 50 countries were telemedicine centers. But within the country, we had about 200 telemedicine centers. But today, that is all a past game. Today, we can give telemedicine through this 24 7. Yeah. An average day, we are giving around 2,000 plus telemedicines alone. But I admire the government when they said during this Athanibar, what they want is they want the already they have laid, uh, you know, the, to the various villages. The Honorable Minister Ravi Sankar called us about two years ago and said, Dr. Eddie, we want you to do telemedicine for the 60,000 villages. 60,000, yeah. Uh, we readily agreed. But then when we went there, they were not speaking normal languages. <laughs> they yeah. a local language. Yeah, uh, so how to connect? Yeah. Difficult. Then we use the Apple. Today, yeah. Yeah, we do a few thousand consults from each of those villages, yeah. maybe five, six consults. So I think today it's going to make a big difference when the government of India made that announcement that they said they'll also give an identification card so that medical history can go on. Yeah. We, we developed a UHID about 15 years ago. We have been using it. But I yeah. think the government one will be available now for every citizen, which yeah. will make a very significant impact in data uh, to, move yeah. around, to, uh, to make them. So I think that medicine. Uh, with uh, the 3G itself, 4G, uh, yeah. 5G is going to totally revolutionize uh, yeah. the way we uh, examine people, the way we use our uh, medical uh, tools to make a diagnosis. I think yeah. it's, it's a, it, it will make a, a major impact in uh, what we're going to see in future of medicine. So the telemedicine, teleconsult, and telelectures I think all of this equipment will be part of the uh, healthcare system. You know, Dr. Reddy, we've covered uh, delivery of everything from very high-end uh, specialty down to telemedicine. Uh, your vision of uh, the future, uh, taking care out of hospitals, into clinics, into home. Uh, I think the opportunities that you have highlighted, not just to better the healthcare and the lot the Indian citizen, but also of the economy through job creation, I think are both very, very valuable uh, inputs that you have provided. Let me just uh, end by asking you, if you had a wide open slate, what are the three things that you are going to focus on or ask the government to focus on in terms of the next three years to improve healthcare and health related jobs in India. You always ask the uh, right things. I think we should, which really are the concerns of the people. We want our uh, people to be happy, the nation to be healthy and happy. Then only we can achieve the goals of being one, two, three in the world. Uh, and we, we can do it. I think what, what today, the uh, way they are connecting the entire country will make a very significant impact in using those to, uh, to connect, to do healthcare for, pe for people in the remote, remotest possible areas. Through so, digital and internet. Yeah, yeah, digitalization yeah. will make a huge impact. And yeah. that is one of the 10 things which uh, the, the Prime Minister again emphasized during yeah. the Independence Day speech. So I think that will make a huge impact. Second, of course, is to make us behave ourselves saying, uh, you don't give give to doing lectures. Use digitalization mm -hmm. uh, and adaptation of digitalization. I think is an attitude and change that, yeah. that that should happen, and I think that will come automatically because if they see that is growing very fast and is overtaking them, and they have yeah. no choice, then they will make a significant impact in whatever business they are. They are. Yeah. I think it will make a very, very big impact. I see that happening. Uh, yeah. Not too far now. 
in one way i said whatever has happened due to covid the damages that the country has having and healthcare has faced a huge problems i don't yeah. know how we're going to face this i must say i i, I really have a lot of pity for the majority of the small hospitals yeah close down and the uh, amounts they owe to, to the institution that has never been touched i hope the government will look after them they, and you will all support them yeah to give them that breathing time uh, to come out because hospitals were not mentioned so i think they they need that support because they we need, need them because yeah. they, are, they are the first uh, you know uh, level of uh, contact for for a patient yeah the, 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 the gps the small nursing homes yeah. then come to back them up whenever they may uh, need this so i think the, and they need financial support right now as well for and we we have spending other on other things cut yeah. a little on each of these i am only asking from 1 to 3% 1.5 to 3% yeah. and public should be more aware of saying that they need to get insured i still remember when i appeared before the malhotra committee for privatization yeah. of uh, healthcare insurance i told him i said look when somebody gets sick it is the business of his wife and friends to take him to a good hospital and make arrangements for his payment but suppose he can take an insurance yeah then his brother is only to find out take him to that hospital yeah that sim that makes him well and yeah. the, the system also will work well so yeah. the insurance should play a greater and greater role in enrolling more here i must admire them they are also paying now in this covid time out of hospital expenses yeah so so this is where i think adapting to the situation and yeah. giving ultimate care is you and i should be there to see that people are healthy and happy and the country yeah. should progress i uh, actually on my last advice for all citizens of india is look yeah. care for your health your you must know the state of your health the only way of us is to do what uh, we have done now this usually heart failure insulin is pro health the pro health will tell you the state of your health and as, as we said for everything we have means to to yeah. bring it under control so you can enjoy a normal life normal health yeah and deny yourself this and so, expensive so we should know how to monitor ourselves and uh, build our own immunity and uh, really pay attention to that i think that's a, a, a wonderful way to end and i think you rightly brought up the area of insurance i know uh, from uh, your daughter our uh, president fiki sangeeta that uh, a lot of work is happening from your group to get insurance to cover outpatients as well uh, and i think that will change the way healthcare is delivered and it won't require us to always check into a hospital to avail of medical insurance and uh, i think the work you are doing on all these fronts dr reddy is just so laudable so thank you to you and uh, your daughters for all that you do in terms of the vision for healthcare uh, that you don't us uh, in the uh, for me my daughter uh, another 80000 people who are my fellow family yes doing all of this good work but i must compliment you i hope uh, as a dynamic banker you'll help more healthcare systems uh, to to make the country healthy and happy if i had that checkbook today i would have signed every one of them over to you doc <laughs> so so thank you so much thank you <laughs>